Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar organized by JetBrains. I'm Paul Everett, PyCharm Developer Advocate, and I'll be your host. The topic for today's webinar is Set Theory and Practice, Grok Python Collection Types. Today, we're joined by Luciana Romalo, Principal Consultant at ThoughtWorks and the author of Fluent Python. Yay, great book. Uh, in O'Reilly book, Luciano is the co-founder of the Brazilian Python Association, and um, I won't pronounce that correctly, uh, and a longtime web pioneer. <laughs> Java, no, later. Uh, long time web pioneer, sorry. Um, this last part is particularly legitimate. You know, you say long time web pioneer, everyone says that. Uh, in this case, Luciano in 1998, uh, that's a long time ago, built the system for the largest tech portal in Brazil. During this time, he and I became very good friends, uh, working in open source together. When I put together my list of potential web webinar presenters, I always wanted to get Luciano. He's been on my to-do list for a long time. We picked this slot especially for Luciano for the lead-in to PyCon. Fluent Python, the O'Reilly book, has turned out to be a seminal book for intermediate Python developers. Uh, Luciano, can you give a quick synopsis of Fluent Python, who's it for, what it covers, et cetera? Well, thank you very much for having me, Paul. It's really a pleasure to be hanging out with you again. Uh, well, first of all, about the book, uh, I wrote the book really thinking about somebody who is already working with Python, so the basics should be very comfortable for, for the reader. And that's why I, I took the liberty of doing something that I had never seen before in a Python book, which was to start the first chapter by talking about special methods, the famous Dunder methods that are behind a lot of the good things that Python right. offers as uh, programmers. So that's... Uh, about the book. And thank you very much for inviting me to to make this presentation. I was actually, this talk was actually selected for PyCon, but then I realized I had a, a scheduling conflict and I won't be able to make it to PyCon. So I'm really glad that I have this opportunity to talk about this uh, here. If I won't be seeing you at PyCon, it's, it's too bad. But anyway, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present this. Uh, one thing to point out, Luciano and I are like an old married couple, um, and <laughs> I've been married a long time, but only a couple of years longer than I've been pseudo married to Luciano. Um, you just <laughs> mentioned Dunder methods. Could you explain what that means for people? Sure. Thanks for asking that, Paul. So Dunder methods are uh, the methods that have an under, under, two, two underscores, before and after the method name. The most common one in people's code is the init, Dunder init, which uh, initializes an object, but there are many others that are interesting. Uh, Dunder is a lot easier to say than under under. Yes. <laughs> um, also, uh, something that we talked about in the interview that we did with you on the PyCharm blog, uh, you've done a bunch of other languages over the years, uh, and I believe you're currently working with Go. This topic of the book, the Python data model, how does it compare to other languages? Well, it's interesting. Every language has its own data model, although most languages call that an object model, which actually mm -hmm. I think is a better name. So the object model of a language is sort of... Uh, a core API that you expect that you expect every ob ob every object in the language to implement. Like for example, a method to convert uh, an object to string, right? For in Java, you have to string. Many languages have that, and it's important that all objects have a method that converts them to string, so that you can actually do debugging, right? You can actually right. print or do debugging and see the value. So, but the thing that I found studying other languages like JavaScript, Go, uh, pretty much almost every language that I've studied so far doesn't have a, such a well uh, documented and, well, and, and total object model that allows us programmers to really implement everything that uh, the, the, the fundamental object types that the language gives, we can also we can emulate all of their behavior. For instance, just a simple example, the len function, uh, it exists in, in Go, but it only works with 
uh, some core types. You cannot create a, a, a Go type that that works with the built-in LAN. You can also create. You cannot also in Go create a, a, a your own collection type that is iterable with their for range construct because the, the Go object model doesn't define a universal way for a, for an object to be iterable or for an object to interact with the LAN uh, function and so on. So yeah, I think they, uh, they just view all that as being an application space, not language space, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting that in Python we have this blurring of this frontier because that enables us to do a lot of what we call Pythonic APIs are really application APIs that offer objects that behave like the built-in types. And that's what makes them feel Pythonic. And in right. other languages, and that's going to be a topic of this talk is a lot of people throw around the word Pythonic as a way to shut up an argument. Uh, you're going to <laughs> focus on the meaning of Pythonic by covering one aspect of Python's data model, the built-in set types, and really give people, uh, arm them with a little bit of a definition of Pythonic. Is that right? Yes, that's right. That's the All idea. Right, All right. So, uh, so the idea of this talk is actually, I have, I have two uh, goals here. One of them is to show why Python set types are a great example of API design. And then afterwards, we're going to actually explain the special methods that make uh, the sets work as they do. Uh, so let's talk about motivation, right? Some common use cases for sets. For instance, suppose you have this story that you need to implement. Display product if all words in the in the query appear in the product description, right? I've actually written code like this. Uh, this is actually Go code and Go doesn't have a set type. So I have to write code like this. Uh, this is a little bit better because now I have a contains and a contains all function instead of having those nested loops, which makes it really hard to reason about, uh, but it's still very inefficient. Uh, because I'm using slices, which are like lists. And uh, so I have to actually scan each slice uh, to de determine whether the other is contained for each element. So it's complicated and it's uh, not very fast. Uh, now, what if, uh, <laughs> this is like, uh, I, I see this a lot, like people reinventing the wheel. And this would be an example of reinventing the wheel, a language a practical language should have a good set type, in my opinion. So because actually uh, this is an example of uh, uh, a subset test, right? You want uh, the, the words that are in Portuguese there, but volley and ball are the query and beach, uh, synthetic and leather are the part of the description. The description also includes ball and, and volley. So you see, if the query is a subset of the description, then yes, this is a match, right? So another example, mark all, product, mark all products previously favorited, except those already in the shopping cart. And this is an example of a set difference. You have the favorite, favorited uh, products, the F set, and the C set is the products in the, in the shopping cart. And I want to uh, remove the, the ones in the shopping cart from the favorite set, right? And the sign that they use that in math is sort of the slanted bar. Uh, anyway, so logic and sets, there's a really close relationship. In fact, since computer science is a branch of math, we can say that sets are really important in computer science because as I found this quote, Nobody has yet discovered a branch of mathematics that has successfully resisted formalization into set theory. Uh, so for instance, logic conjunction is actually intersection, right? I'm, <clears throat> uh, when you say X belongs to the intersection of A and with B, you're also saying X belongs to A and also belongs to B, right? Uh, so you can see this a lot in computer science, right? You can see this in, in for instance, in, in query language, in SQL, and every other non-SQL database uh, usually implements uh, uh, 
methods or operators to do this kind of, of, of operation. This junction is actually a union, right? So if you say X belongs to the union of A and B, that's the same as saying that X belongs to A or X belongs to B. Uh, symmetric difference, which is to say that X belongs to A or belongs to B, but does not belong to both. This is like what we like to call the ex exclusive or in computer science, right? Is also the, uh, the union minus the intersection of both sets is one other way of understanding. And difference is that operation where you uh, subtract the elements of one set from the elements of the other set, right? So several languages have sets, but what, what I've noticed, well, some, set, some languages don't have sets built in at all, like Go, but some languages like Java and JavaScript have a set type. In JavaScript more recently, in ES6 has a set type. But those set types, you can see on this table, offered by those languages, have men, less than 10 methods. So they are called, they are what I call narrow set APIs. Because what they give you is basically an abstract data type that ensures that no element will be duplicated. But they don't offer you those operations that are fundamental in, in, in set theory, like intersection, union, and so on. Uh, in contrast, Python. .NET and Ruby offer rich uh, set APIs, uh, you know, wide set APIs that implement not only the basic behavior of a set uh, data type, but also set operations that you can use when programming. So let's talk about sets in Python. <clears throat> so here's an example. I'm going to build a set from the first 10 numbers of the Fibonacci sequence. Right, so these are cells from our Jupyter notebook that I used that I used to make these examples. So you see the Fibonacci function, you pass it a stop, and then it stops when uh, one of the numbers gets to that stop. So, uh, and then on the second cell, what you see is a set comprehension. So all uh, listeners who are comfortable with the idea of uh, list comprehensions, Set comprehension use the same syntax, but to build a set. So the only difference is that the the enclosing uh, uh, curly braces instead of the square brackets, right? So in this example, the Fibonacci sequence everybody knows uh, includes two ones, but you see that the set result has only one one because that's the most fundamental invariant for a set type that elements cannot be duplicated, right? So that's how you build a set from any from from a generator function in this example, or actually from any object that that is uh, that produces an iterator. This is another example. I'm not going to go into the code. The code. I just need another example because I want to have two sets. So the first set. And let me go back a little bit. The first set is the F set is the Fibonacci numbers, and uh, up to ten, excluding. And the second set is the primes up to 10, excluding, right? So the, the P set, the F, the F set and the P set. I'm going to use them in examples. So one thing that is, uh, I mentioned that before when we were talking about uh, object models in other languages. One thing that is really desirable is that objects have a way of representing themselves as strings. And Python actually is uh, has a, a richer API in that regard than most languages, because it defines actually two special methods to do that. So the first is the dunder stir, and the second is the dunder wrapper method. So basically, if you implement a dunder stir method in your class, when, you, when a, a user uh, takes one object of your class, let's say X, and says and writes print X, what's going to happen is the Python interpreter is going to call the stir method of uh, the object to turn into a string that print can display. An interesting thing is that the, the, the default implementation of stir in uh, the object type, which is the base type of all types in Python, uh, actually calls the dunder wrapper method as a fallback. So if you don't implement dunder stir, 
the result is uh, what whatever Dunder wrapper represents. And what Dunder wrapper represents uh, by default from object is one of the that, that uh, angle bracket notation that we are familiar with, where it says such and such object at such and such position has a hexadecimal number that's the position in memory of the object. That's not very useful, but uh, in the case of uh, wrapper, of, of sets, for instance, Python uh, actually implements this nice notation, which is like the syntax for building a set, right? Um, anyway, uh, an, 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 uh, another interesting thing about the wrapper is that you have to be careful because then the wrapper can be used in debugging and logging. So if, if a collection has lots of elements, you don't want to display them all, right? It wouldn't be, let's, let's say you have a set with a million numbers. You don't probably want the million numbers displayed in the log. That will not be useful at all. So Python actually has a, a, a library called wrapper that has a function called wrapper that you can use to implement your own wrappers. And it helps because it knows when to replace a long list of items uh, by with an ellipsis. It puts an ellipsis in the middle, so it shows only the first n uh, items by default. It has a lot of useful functionality. Anyway, so these are just the beginning. We're just scratching the surface here of this idea of the object model. Uh, so the idea is you want uh, objects in Python to implement at least the wrapper. Uh, also, then the stir if it's useful. And if you want to display to end users a different kind of uh, string, then they want them the one that will be shown to programmers when debugging. So those are the two basic uh, methods that I think that every object that you implement in Python uh, should have for your own sake as a programmer for debugging, for instance, right? Uh, okay, another operation with sets, another very basic operation is to determine whether an element belongs in a set, whether the element exists in the set. So for that, we use the in operator. And in order to make that work, we implement the Dunder contains uh, special methods. That's what uh, does that. Now, Python is interesting because uh, there is a, a, most Python collections inherit from some abstract based classes that do implement Dunder contains for you, but they do it in a way that is uh, that may not be optimal for your collection. What the default Dunder contains does is it actually iterates over the object. So it scans, there's a full scan of the object to, to try and see if, if an element matches. So that's built in and it works okay for lists or array-like objects. But for sets, of course, we have a better way of doing that. And, uh, I'm going to show an implementation of set later on that includes, of course, the other contains. <clears throat> this, uh, these are some examples of those fundamental set operations we talked about before, intersection, union, symmetric, difference, and difference. And here's the thing that I want to comment about, because I've heard people complain that this is not readable. There are also, uh, Python also offers offer, uh, methods that spell out these uh, operations. <clears throat> but, and I'm gonna talk about the method soon, but I actually do find this readable. You know, I think one thing about readability is that you need to actually learn to read the language, right? I don't think this is unreadable. I think this is, uh, it just makes some sense if you know that the commercial E operator is a, uh, bitwise, uh, uh, bitwise <clears throat> end. So it makes sense that it, it is the, the, the op operator that they use for the intersection. It's interesting to, to comment that the operator end spelled out as A and D in Python cannot be over, uh, over, overridden, but that one can. And you actually see that a lot, right? In, in for instance, if you're doing uh, Django queries, Django queries implement these operators as well for doing some uh, combination of, of criteria, of filtering, right? So union is with the 
uh, bitwise R sign, which also makes sense. Symmetric division is with the bitwise shore, and differences with the minus sign, which also makes sense, in my opinion. Uh, there are also uh, operators for compa set comparisons, like greater than, greater than, or equal. Uh, and these are equivalent to those symbols in math that I show at the top of this slide, right? Whether a set is contained in another, is uh, whether a set is a superset of an, uh, or as a sub subset of another, or a strict subset, or a superset, or a strict superset. So you 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 have these operators as well in Python written with the greater than, less and uh, less than sign. And here is where I, 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 I'm trying to, I, did, I put this here, you know, the Morgan's law, which, which is that equivalence on the last cell, the, the cell with number, number 20, the equivalence that says <clears throat> that uh, uh, the difference of an intersection is like the union of the differences. Uh, anyway. I put this here basically to show how, it, how, how good it is to have uh, operator overloading because these, is, these expressions can be understood much better using this notation with the operators then they would be uh, they would be much less reasonable if there was a, a lot of method calls involved in these operations right anyway so this is the second the Morgan's law again is an example where the operator uh, notation makes the thing more readable than it would be with the method calls. So let's talk about the set methods that are implemented <coughs> by the, the set types in Python. So what you see here is a table from my book, uh, Fluent Python. And uh, so on the first column, you see the math symbol of the operation. In the second column, you see uh, the Python operators that implement that. In the third column, you see the methods that does the same thing. So anyway, uh, operator overloading in Python works with special methods. So you see the first example there is uh, the commercial E is implemented in the class by implemented uh, the under end methods. And there's another thing that I won't have time to talk about right now, but I'll talk about it later. But anyway, there's a reversed operator as well. This is when you need an operator to work with distinct types. So maybe, for instance, I want the N, the commercial E, to work with a set and a list. You know, to be clear, actually in Python, that is not uh, valid. You cannot do the, inter the, the intersection of a set and a list in Python using the commercial E operator. But let's imagine you will, you want to do that uh, in your own class. So in order to do that, and <clears throat> because uh, intersection is an operation that is commutative, so it doesn't matter, matter if you say the intersection of S and Z or the intersection of Z and S, the results should be, should be the same, right? But let's say that Z is a list. In that case, the second example uh, would not work by default because Z being a list does not implement the under end, right? So what, what, the way Python solves this is by doing this reverse operator that I'm gonna explain more later. But it's a way of uh, a Python that has this mechanism that allows the second operand to have a say in the result of the operation. Anyway, the third line on this table is S intersection. So like I said before, this is one of the methods that spell out the operators. But I really like this API because not only it gives an option for people who prefer to spell out the names of the operations instead of using the, the operators, but it also offers something else that you could not do with the operators, which is the ability to pass several uh, uh, arguments. So you can compute the intersection between S and several other sets at the same time, because you can pa pass multiple 
uh, arguments to the intersection method. And another thing that's interesting is that, uh, like I was talking before, the commercial E operator for sets only works if both sides of both operands are sets. But if you have a situation where you you want to make it work with another iterable, then you can do it, but using the intersection method. So the intersection method actually takes arguments that are any iterable and consumes those iterables to build sets inside and then compute uh, you know, the results. Those three uh, first line uh, operations like the commercial E and the intersection method <clears throat> that return a new uh, object. Uh, and this is important because in, in Python operators, uh, or no simple operators should always return a new object and not modify the operands in any way. But the fourth line shows uh, this, com this combination of the commercial with the equal sign, so it's an assignment. And this uh, in Python, if the left hand side operand is mutable, this that operation usually changes the operand in place the targets, which is the S in this uh, example. So that's implemented by the I end, uh, the under I end special method, which you can understand as the in place end. And uh, there's also a method called intersection update that has the same uh, behavior that changes S in place, but then again, it uses, it can consume one or more iterables instead of just sets as arguments, right? So you will see this pattern for the for the intersection operators repeated again below for the union operators. So there is the pipe operator, which is the bitwise or, which is implemented as the dunder or method. There is also a union uh, method, and there is a, and the, in this case the update method instead of being called union update, they decided to call it update probably because there is a, already a method in Dix that is called update that has similar semantics. So it's called just update, the method that updates a set in place with the elements of the iterable or iterables given, right? Hey, Luciano, we need a chance, we got a pile up of questions. Sure, that's a uh, good Do you want to do a little bit more and then take point. questions or go ahead and take them now? No, no, we can, we can, we can take. What, what I can do is, I have another slide similar to this, okay. and then, and I'm just gonna go over really quickly over it. It just yeah. talks again. It's the same pattern that we saw before, with the operators uh, that are that return a new set or that uh, modify the set in place, and then and the operate the methods that spell out, and finally, this is the last one of this. A set of, of slides. These are the methods for the comparison or the tests, actually, like the contains that I mentioned before and the others. So go ahead with the questions. Uh, first one is relevant to this. Are you going to uh, share the slides with us? Can we email a link to the slides later? Yes, totally. I'm going to share it as soon as we finish. And also the source code that I'm going to show the source Perfect. code is already available, actually. All right. Um, yeah. First question is very general. Uh, you could spend hours talking about it. Try to just spend a little bit of time and reflect it back to the book. Uh, best. What are the best Python topics to master for a beginner or intermediate? And what does Fluent Python go over in this regard? Okay. I think the first thing is uh, object-oriented programming. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, that's important because Python is object oriented, but also Python has its own flavor of object orientation. Like Java has its own flavor, C Sharp has its own flavor, but Java and C Sharp have a similar flavor. Python has a distinct flavor. And I think mm -hmm. people should understand some of the ways that we do things in, in Python that are different ways of doing object oriented programming. So there's a whole section of my book that's about that. Uh, several chapters that talk about that. Uh, for instance, one topic that is not covered in some, uh, in, well, in Java at all, because because Java doesn't have multiple inheritance. 
Python does. Uh, it's not something that you want to use a lot or right. overuse, but it is useful in some cases, and I discussed that in the book. The second thing I think people, everybody should learn about Python is about this whole concept of iterables and iterators mm. and generator functions, because right. these are also not, not so common in other languages. And uh, it's really valuable to understand that. And then you start to leverage a lot more of the standard library because it has a lot of power in this regard. And I was going to ask you on some of these yeah. set operations like reverse, do they return a generator? An iterable? What do they return? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I, I didn't talk about, I don't think I talk about reverse, but yes, uh, you can implement for your, uh, well, reverse in the case of sets doesn't make sense because uh, sets are unordered. That's one characteristic of them. So the, ah. the order, the order that you, uh, of the elements that you get out of a set is undefined by definition. And it mm. is undefined, in fact, in Python. Uh, because of the way the hash, uh, under, the underlying hash table works. But uh, I'm going to actually show okay. code that sh shows how my own set type becomes iterable because I'm going to implement the dunder iter methods. Okay. All right, cool. Let's go on to the uh, couple of questions, and then you can get back to that later. Um, uh, first mm -hmm. detail question is from our own Andre Vlasovsky, who's the... Uh, PyCharm Community Edition team lead. He asked, what do you think of introducing an immutable dict like a frozen dict in Python? I think it's a great idea. I actually missed that. Uh, I think people are recognizing more and more the value of immutable mm -hmm. other structures these days because it uh, helps with uh, Up, we lost you. There is an obscure, I forgot the name now, but there is an obscure implementation of a, of a read-only uh, dict in Python that's used internally, that mm -hmm. caches thing. I forgot. But, uh, but I, I can uh, send Andre the, the link later. Um, what is the exact meaning of set? We had two questions related to this. Uh, for example, the set function. Um, and the set mm -hmm. data type uh, mm -hmm. from an implementation perspective under the hood, the mechanics, the protocol perspective. Uh, can you disambiguate the set function from the set data type? I can, but yeah. So it's kind of, it kind of the question. The difference is sort of the, dif the difference between the name or, or the name of a class and the mm -hmm. class itself. Ah, perfect. you know, because set, yeah, set is just the name of the type, and it's also the uh, the the thing that you call to build an instance of that type. But that's the same thing that happens with any class that you create, right? Because in Python we don't mm -hmm. have the new operator, so you call the class name as if it were a function to obtain an instance. So that's that's yeah. basically it. Okay, hey, last yeah. question. And I, I think it's related a little bit to this uh, emergence of NumPy and Pandas and all these really high performance mm -hmm. data structures that are set oriented, mm -hmm. uh, that are implemented mm -hmm. in C or Jesus, even across mm -hmm. GPUs and things like that. Uh, so the question mm -hmm. is, what do I need to implement so that a custom object can be added to a set? Oh, good question. So basically, uh, and uh, and also my book covers that in a lot of detail. And, oh, okay. But anyway, in the chapter about uh, dicts and sets. But anyway, uh, as an object to be to, to 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 be an element of a set must be hashable, because under under the covers a hash table is used, and in order to be hashable, you need to implement a hash function, uh, under hash actually, uh, and uh, which returns an integer. And the object must be immutable. Uh, so those are the constraints that you have to work with. Uh, right. So, yeah. All right. So uh, for it, further information, buy the book, right? <laughs> yeah. But here's yeah. another. Oh, yeah. And, and, and by the way, there's a very good uh, offer right now going on, Humble Bundle, oh, with, yeah. uh, which include, includes a license of, of 
of a few months of pie there for, for of, of PyCharm uh, and and Fluent Python and other great Python books and other tools for like twenty dollars. So yep. yeah, it's actually a, a great okay. moment to do that. <clears throat> right. But um, I want to go back to the NumPy thing. There's one thing because NumPy does implement set operations, particularly pandas has a lot of that. But there, there's a, a a big difference that people need to understand between the 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 numeric the NumPy ecosystem and the the built-in libraries of Python. The built-in libraries of Python, they privilege working lazily with iterables, iterators, generators, and things like that, which are great for data engineering when you are uh, handling huge huge amounts of data that won't fit in memory. On the other hand, the NumPy uh, and library and all the, the libraries derived derive from it, they are mostly optimized for doing things in memory. So nowadays we, we have a lot of memory, so we can put a, fit a lot of mem uh, data in memory, but they are optimized to do that in memory. So they're extremely fast, they use vectorized operations and so on, but it's two different ways of thinking. And actually I believe uh, uh, a good Python programmer needs to understand those two ways of thinking. I wanted to mention that. Yeah, sure. Uh, we're down to about 20 minutes left, so uh, I'll stop yeah. bugging you with questions and let you uh, head over to some Python. Oh, the questions were great. Thank you very much for everybody who asked and, and keep them coming. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, finally, there are some methods that the set type implements that uh, have nothing to do with math, but with practical needs of computer science. Because we actually, you know, you need to, sometimes you need to copy a set or you need to el remove elements and so on. And in this case, I show here with those little bullets, which are implemented by set and which are implemented by frozen sets. Of course, only the ones that don't change the set are implemented by frozen sets, right? Uh, anyway, and the pop method is one that I want to call out because this is, this is such an example of good design, API design. Some other set APIs that I have seen don't have a pop method, but the pop method is really useful because given that sets are unordered, it's really convenient to have a way of getting any element from the set without having to name what the element is. And pop does that for you. So you can consume all the elements in a set by using a for loop that just calls pop repeatedly or a while loop. So this is really good, good API design in my opinion. Anyway, so uh, one thing that's useful for people learning more about Python is to, and the, something that did not exist when, when uh, uh, I started with Python and certainly not when uh, Paul started with Python several years before I did, was this idea of ABCs, abstract based classes. <clears throat> We don't use them a lot in daily Python programming, but as a teacher, I find those abstract classes useful to explain to people the behavior. Like for instance, remember Paul, how many documentations we have uh, either read or written that said, oh, this behaves like a sequence. Okay, what is that? Right. You know, for, for seasoned Pythonistas, we knew what that meant, but it wasn't spelled out clearly anywhere. And now, because of the abstract uh, classes, we have that in Python. So it's really great. So it's really great to understand that if you look at the middle of this uh, diagram, a set is an interface in Python that implements the is disjoint method and all of those other methods that are basically operators. Uh, but it inherits on the left side from container, iterable, and size, which are also other three ABCs that are very, very fundamental. And on the uh, right side, you see the mutable mutable interface in, inherits from the set interface. So it has all of those operators and also a few other methods. So uh, if you want to implement something that looks like a set, you look at the ABC and that's what you have, what you need to do. If you want to, want to implement something that looks like a sequence, there's also an ABC for that that you can look up. So let's talk about operator overloading. Some languages don't have it because uh, it was considered an abused uh, feature in C++, right? Which, which was the first popular language that implemented operator over overloading. So I found this uh, uh, quote by James Gosling where he says that he 
was kind of torn about this decision, but in the end he left out. But it's really important. Like I said before, this is an example of just a simple expression in Python that computes uh, compound interest. And in Java, the, 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 well, the nice thing of, of the top version is the top, the, the expression in Python works for any numeric types because all the numeric types in the standard library come with the operators overloaded to do the proper thing. And you can create your own uh, crazy numeric type. And actually NumPy does that because NumPy has fixed size floats and integers that are more memory efficient. So they implement all of these operators and they can, and you can write that uh, with any numeric type in Python that implements the operators. But in Java, because Java and Go, for instance, are two languages that don't have operator overloading, if you're not using one of the primitive types for which the operators are defined, uh, you have to you know, go back to that uh, method notation, which is really unreadable, in my opinion. So on that debate about the readability of operators, I'm really on the side that, yes, operators make your code more readable and not less. Of course, if you use them, if you use them properly, it is uh, operator overloading is also a very good way of doing uh, code obfuscation. But <clears throat> okay, so comparison operators, I think we've we talked about that. Uh, yeah, so so we have a, th these are a list of complete uh, complete lists of methods in Python for the, all of the operators because I didn't want to to restrict this talk to sets. We're talking about sets here, but as an example of uh, a class that implements uh, operators and other things that you may want to have in any Python object that you want. And this is the algorithm for uh, doing the reverse operation. So the idea is, let's say A plus B, and let's say the A is a set and B is a number, right? An integer. So if you do A plus B and B and A has uh, the, the, the add method, so we're on the top right here, the top left here, then um, this is this algorithm actually is implemented in C in the Python interpreter. So the interpreter will check to see if the A operand, the first operand has a dunder add, and if it has it, we'll call that. But that operand may produce a normal result or it may produce a special result called not implemented. In that case, that's where it goes and looks at the B uh, operand, uh, operand to see if it has a reverse add. And then the same idea. If it has and it returns a normal result, that's the result. If that method returns not implemented, then the, the interpreter raises, raise, uh, raise type error. So I think this is a beautiful thing. I don't have a lot of time to explain that. But uh, if you go over it slowly uh, with, with examples, uh, go over this flow chart, I think you can understand it. And I As just, a reminder, we have like 15 minutes left. Yeah, and I, I just went to, I actually got, got to the conclusion. But before the conclusion, I want to show code, actually, because they promised that I was going to show you that. So I'm going to switch over to PyCharm. And I'm going to uh, enter presentation mode, presentation mode. Yeah, so I think this is better. Maybe everybody can read. Yeah, that looks so this good. Is an, thank you. So this is an example of a, of a, a set type that I actually, uh, the idea of this set type I copied from a Go book in the, the Go programming language book by Donovan and Kernigan. They implement this set type that uses as a, a, a bitmap as the representation, right? So it's a set that only holds integer, uh, unsigned integers. And uh, it does that by basically having an array of 64-bit uh, uh, unsigned integers. And then if a bit is on in that array, it means that the, the equivalent number exists in the array, right? So it's a representation. That has uh, well. First of all, it is uh, in terms of uh, uh, of if it's as efficient in terms of of, of computation 
as the standard implementation because, for instance, checking whether an element is present is uh, constant. Uh, uh, big O notation is O of one because you just do a calculation to see the offset of the word and the offset of the bit and see if the bit is on and off. So that's that's quick regardless of the size of the set. And <clears throat> some operations are then, uh, you know, so an interesting thing is, for instance, the the intersection between two sets in this in, in, in this representation is done by doing actual the actually the bitwise end of the words that represent the set. So that should should be re really fast. I haven't actually timed. This is a didactic example that I developed just to show uh, sort of a complete implementation of a set type. But what I wanted to show people here are, is the, the special methods, right? So you see the dunder int, init that everybody knows. Dunder len just returns the, the len of this array that holds, uh, oh, it's not the len of the array, sorry. The dunder len here is actually kept up to date because the array, like I'm using here, is an array of 64 bits. So each element of the array actually holds 64 possible positions. The len here is giving me the actual number of items that are in the set, and not the how much memory the set is occupying, right? Uh, so anyway, the len is this element that I have to is this uh, uh, attribute that I have to keep updating. So for instance, the add element, the add method here, <clears throat> what it does is it it adds one element. And after some, you know, bit fiddling, which is required by the implementation, the important thing here is this: it adds one to the length. Because since I, I just added an element, uh, I need to add one to the length, and then contains. Uh, you know what? Maybe we. I just found a bug. I don't have. I don't mean. No. Yeah, maybe I just found a bug because the length. Shouldn't be updated always. Oh, okay. But if the element is already in the self, in the set, I return. So I don't do that. No, okay. So this is the normal case where the element is not present. <sighs> I thought I had a bug. Anyway, then there contains. So this is the one that works with the in operator, right? To check whether an element is in the set. So basically, I do this. Uh, little math and then do get bit, which is a bitwise operation that I implement uh, below. So then there contains is for the in. Then there iter. This is interesting because there was a question before about iterables. So in order to create an iterable object, you have to implement a then there iter method, and that and that then there iter method should return an iterator. In this case, this under this and then there iter method is actually a generator method it, because it has the yield function, the yield uh, keyword inside the body. So actually calling the iterator will give you a, a generator object that is managed by the Python uh, interpreter and that implements the interface of an, uh, of an iterator, like the next method. So anyway, this is how you make a, a collection iterable. You have to implement a dunder iter. And so this is the dunder wrap that we talked about before. Copy, or dunder or, right? And here's an interesting thing. I do the dunder or and I implement union using the dunder or. Right? Uh, anyway. Uh, and one thing that I do is uh, for the union, because I want to be like, I want to emulate the set API in Python. So the union method accepts multiple arguments. So you see here star others. And those arguments don't need to be sets. They can be <clears throat> uh, any iterable. So what I do is I verify, and this is a kind of a set. Uh, this is, for instance, one thing about the way of thinking about uh, object-oriented programming in Python. This is, uh, I am embracing here the fact that it's a dynamic type language. And, I, and uh, we check types by checking attributes and not by checking type declaration. So what I'm doing here is, if the other object doesn't have an, uh, uh, so our my set implementation here has to have a dunder words element, 
which is the array that contains the bits. And if it doesn't, then I convert by calling the constructor uint set with the other uh, argument. So this builds me a set from anything that is iterable because my constructor accepts, uh, see the constructor over there, accept, accepts an iterable. If it's an iterable, the second argument, I will iterate over it and add to the set. So anyway, uh, the important thing here is that I, I, I make this check. And if it's not one of uh, the set types that I know about, I, I'm, I'm going to convert it. And this will work with any set type that Palette implements that are iterable and other with lists and other things. Anyway, so this is what I wanted to show. The implementation is already published. I'm gonna show the URL for this in another place. And it's kind of complicated because of all the bit fiddling, but it's an interesting example of a set type that may actually be useful uh, in some circumstances. It's not just uh, a toy. So let's go back to the conclusion. So, the, the takeaways that uh, uh, I want to share with you uh, for this talk is, first of all, set operations can greatly simplify logic in your program. So if you aren't uh, used to using sets, start thinking about them and maybe you're gonna simplify a lot of code and realize that maybe you have written code before that you did not need to, 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 have to write because uh, the sets implement a lot of logic for you. Uh, I also mentioned that Pythonic objects should implement a the wrapper method for the string representation. If you do testing, which I do and I highly recommend, you should also implement a Dunder EQ because uh, you need to be able to compare instances of the objects that you create. So in the Dunder EQ is the basic way of doing that to overload the equals equals operator. And Pythonic collections should also implement at least Dunder Len to give the number of items that are in the collection, Dunder Iter to make the collection iterable, and then the contains to make it easy for somebody to check whether an element is present by using in. And the example that I, I've shown before is at that uh, GitHub URL, Stand Up Dev is one of my Twitter handles. It's also an organization that I've been using um, on GitHub to create examples like this. And uinset is the name of it because it, it's a set for unsigned integers. And uh, like we said before, you can learn more about this in Fluent Python. And that's basically it. I thought there was a thank you slide, but I seem to have missed it. So uh, you have time for some questions. Oh, yeah. Yes. All right, great. Okay. All right, great. Uh, we'll start. We have three questions that haven't been answered in graduating levels of complexity. First from Nikita. Mm -hmm. um, could you recommend a good introduction to the basics of set theory that's relevant to programming? Mm, that's a very good question, but uh, no. <laughs> but I, what I... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think I maybe have, may have seen it in introductory chapters in database books, I don't know. But the, the Wikipedia for math and computer science is really good and I actually did look at Wikipedia to uh, do some research about that, yeah. All right, great. Uh, second question from Paolo, uh, and this is one related to an earlier question, also related to what I was, uh, question I was gonna ask. Can we trust these set methods as the best performing implementation or are there hacks to do faster intersection union, et cetera? So here's the thing, I haven't, uh, I, I, I believe they are highly efficient. Yes, they are highly optimized. They use the, the hash table uh, data structure underneath, which is really fast, but uh, for very specific types, like for instance, for the integers in this example, I haven't actually finished, uh, well, I haven't actually started, but I want to do tests, performance tests mm -hmm. on my implementation. I think my implementation is gonna be slower because then the Python one for doing even for you know sets of integers, because 
it, there's a lot of for loops in Python, and we know <clears throat> that these are expensive. You need to do as much as possible to optimize Python code. You need to delegate as much as possible loops to the C implementation of Python. Right. And I have a lot of explicit for loops in my code. But I'm going to also try, and uh, this has become sort of a little project for me. I want to also try and do them in Cyton. You know? Yes. Uh, so I'm gonna, yeah. Yes, I'm going to... I'm going to take this code and create another version and add as much Cyton code right, gradually, you know, add Cyton code and see what happens with the performance. That's going to be that's, that's what I was going to bring up on this is the takeaway from this webinar and what you talked about on ABCs back when you and I got started. Everyone thinks yeah. of the data model as the implementations in the Python standard library. Mm -hmm. They should be thinking of the Python data model as the protocols and interfaces in that yes, there are totally. numerous implementations outside of the standard library. The standard mm -hmm. library has to handle the general case. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you very much for saying that clearly because that's what that was a key takeaway that I failed to mention. And that's the reason that I why, that I chose this set example because it, the implementation yeah. is completely different from what happens in Python with the set types in Python, but the API is very similar because that's the whole point of the data model. It's really right. about protocols, which is another word for interfaces. For some of us that worked with a little bit of small talk before, is what they called interfaces. They called protocols, right? And coming to a pep yeah. near you, right? Yes. <laughs> There's a pet being discussed awesome. about protocols uh, for structured typing. Um, yes. But what you mentioned about Cython is my answer to Paolo is uh, if you have a very, very custom case, go to Cython, maybe go to Python, but go to Cython and implement the very narrow use cases you need optimized for your constraints and you can probably get an order of magnitude or more performance, right? Yes. Okay, next up is yes. Andre. This is a good question. He's really going to challenge you on this one. It's a frozen up to, uh, it's a follow-up, <laughs> funny, uh, follow-up to the immutable frozen dict one. Um, he found PEP 416 and it was rejected. He doesn't feel in a convincing way. And it mentioned mapping proxy type that is a read-only dict. Um, and that the PEP and the class mentioned are not about purely functional data structures uh, for mapping with lightweight operations for adding and removing, etc. cetera. Um, I like the question he's asking. I do a lot of front end JavaScript and boy, the JavaScript world has gone off the deep end for immutability and then went deeper and then went deeper still. And the Python community hasn't really gotten even close to talking about immutability the way that, that they have, whether it's in the standard library like this PEP discusses or just in, in add-on packages. Yes. Well, and, 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 and there's another thing we, we mentioned before about the, the different ways of thinking when you talk about the standard library in Python and about uh, everything that's derived from NumPy. And so the, the NumPy people are strong believers in sharing data, mm -hmm. in, 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 in mutable structures, because they are concerned with performance, right? Right. And, uh, and if you need to copy a lot of data around, Sometimes when you lose you performance. Sharing, you don't mean across process boundaries. You mean just shared memory sharing, right? Yes, exactly. Shared memory, exactly. And it's interesting because I also find this in the Google and the Go community. Go, because it was created by Google to solve large scale problems for Google, mm. has a lot of preoccupation with performance. And mm -hmm. I, I and this seeps into the community. So the community talks a lot about performance, and I. Um, and one of the, and then and you see that in, that in the language. So the language kind of encourages uh, reusing data structures and and, and and with this slice type, for instance, is a reference to a part to a view of an array. You know, this concept of a view over an array is very some very much the basis of NumPy itself. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. Uh, 
Yeah, this is so, a, so a very Andre's good question. question. I think gets back to this prep yes. and it being rejected, but he doesn't really mm -hmm. think about a purely functional data structure. He thinks it's just about a read-only data structure. Do you have any comments on the difference yeah. between this two? Um, or do you know anything about no, no. following this PEP no. when it was being discussed? No, no. What, 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 what I do know, which is interesting, is uh, the author of the PEP was Victor Stinner. Victor Stinner reviewed the chapter about a Sync IO in my book. Okay. Because at the time, I think I was really right. new, and the other excellent reviewers that we had didn't have experience with it. So Victor Stinner. Uh, did that, and he is famous for his contributions in this asynchronous world in Python. And of course, and I probably he feels the need for that because of the same reason that like people have adopted immutable structures in JavaScript, right? You want to make sure that uh, your de data is not uh, changed in ways that you did not expect when you're doing concurrent programming. So yeah, I don't know about the details of implementation and the, the motivation, but I think that's probably, I assume that's the reason because Victor Stein is involved. Um, I also like, like you said, besides uh, Go, I've, I've been studying Elixir and Elixir is, uh, uses the Erlang virtual machine underneath and both Erlang and Elixir are basically just immutable data structures all over. Everything is immutable. And it's interesting, it makes you think in, in different ways, but it does, but the important thing is it does solve a lot of problems or avoids a lot of problems in concurrent programming. Right, right. Yeah, and uh, the world of JavaScript has um, kind of a performance profile for what it's trying to scale into uh, in his embraced immutability and some of these functional patterns wholeheartedly as a way to get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. very interesting. So um, we'll go ahead and switch over to my screen if that's okay. Uh, just if you could, we do have a couple of other questions that came up and I'm sure that we'll have others when people go and look at the webinar. Is it okay if we send those over to you if we can't handle them ourselves? Totally, yes. All right. So, and I would thanks, also Luciana. like to see the ones that you did handle. <laughs> okay, sure. We've got those as well. Um, All right. Thank thanks, you. Thanks for taking the time to talk with us about the meaning of Pythonic. I I feel like you could do a, a three year conference tour covering the meaning of Pythonic. <laughs> I'll cover Python nineteen ninety four. You cover Pythonic. How about that? That that's cool. And let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> But the meaning of Pythonic, the Python data model, the built-in set types, uh, I encourage everyone to take a look at the book Fluent Python. It's thick, but it's a very enjoyable read, especially if you are like me, you've got experience with Python, but really haven't gotten deep into some of the data structures and the why as much as the what. Um, if you have any questions later, please don't hesitate to reach out to us by email or social media. If you'd like to get more information on PyCharm, please go to our website at jetbrains.com slash PyCharm. We'd love your feedback on this webinar, so please feel free to contact us on Twitter or in the after webinar survey. Fill in that survey. We're going to ask you to fill in the survey. You're going to be tempted to say, I want to go get a coffee, close the window. We actually do read that, and it helps us plan for uh, further webinars. Uh, the recording will be made available on our YouTube channel soon uh, that we'll announce um, on our blog and in Twitter. If you haven't already, pre please check out the blog. We've got a lot of up-to-date resources on there about news, about releases and events, a lot happening in the world of PyCharm, especially with us going to PyCon next week. We have a booth. Come see us, um, especially on the opening night if you're at the opening reception. Um, for example, the recording of this webinar will be published there. Recordings for previous webinars, we just had uh, Julia Looney talk about user models in Django, and before that, Matt Harrison in data science, before that, Brian Aachen on PyTest, a lot of good stuff recently. Uh, we'll also provide some additional links like Luciano's slides and a link to his GitHub repo um, and other information from the presentation on the blog. That's it from us today. Thank you very much for joining us and hope you have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.